Thomas Saz is an enigma. He's a trained psychiatrist who spent decades railing against psychiatry. He said that mental illness is a myth, compared involuntary psychiatric treatment to slavery, and made a case that all drugs, including psychiatric ones, should be available on a free market. Saz wrote a lot of books, 33 to be exact, making these arguments. But as a writer, this, in my view, nuanced thinker, is hard to understand for two main reasons. His writing is both crystal clear and highly rhetorical. Reading Saz feels like reading someone like Thomas Paine, a very adept writer who sees himself engaged in an existential battle. So Saz can often be misunderstood, taken as more extreme than maybe he was, and the nuance is missed. In this video, I want to give you my articulation of the anti-psychiatric writings of Thomas Saz. First, a warning. I'm not a medical doctor, but a philosopher interested in ideas, so I'm not here to give any sort of medical advice, not even remotely so. My aim is to explain the arguments of Thomas Saz, who had very controversial ideas about psychiatry. So if you're struggling with mental health, then Saz be damned, you should talk to a professional about this issue who's equipped to help you. I am not that person. In most of his books, Saz starts in the same way, arguing that mental illness is a myth and that psychiatric language, things like diagnosis, treatment, is really a bad metaphor. He first gained popularity with a book-length version of this argument that he published in 1974, appropriately called The Myth of Mental Illness. Here's the argument. Medical fields diagnose disorders that have identifiable bodily causes. When you go to a doctor complaining of an ailment, the doctor listens to your symptoms, yes, but can follow up with x-rays, blood tests, things like that to look for the physical root or marker of that ailment. And while the doctor can and will treat the symptoms, they will often be able to treat the physical cause of the disorder with medicine that acts on you physiologically. This, Saz notes, is not how psychiatry works. First, psychiatry has not been able to trace a single one of its disorders to a pathogen as a cause. Psychiatrists deal only in symptoms. And while psychiatrists may have occasion to request blood tests, for instance, to monitor patients with drug dependencies. They can often do all of their job without ever examining a patient's physiology. Even when prescribing psychiatric drugs that work on the patient's physiology, these are generally monitored by talking with the patient, listening to herself report about how the treatment is working. In many works, Saz makes a subtle but important point here. If we look at the books psychiatrists use to make patient diagnoses, each disorder is a collection of symptoms only, with no reference to physical pathogens at all. Put it this way, if I come to a doctor complaining of chest pains, the doctor can do tests to figure out the bodily causes of my chest pains. If I go to a psychiatrist complaining of anything from unwanted irritability to hallucinations, the doctor can't and generally won't try to figure out a physiological cause because psychiatric diagnoses generally don't require inquiry about causes. Saz adds to this, Oftentimes, those with what we call mental illness can benefit significantly from talk therapies or meditation, or things that work on one's psyche first and only indirectly on physiology. If I have a broken leg or skin disease, I can't be talked to good health. My physiology must be directly acted on. But if I have an anxiety or depression disorder, talking to a counselor or psychologist can itself significantly impact my treatment. This leads Saz to conclude, quote, My point is that to speak of elevated blood pressure and hypertension, of sugar in the urine and diabetes, all as organic symptoms, and to place them in the same category as hysterical pains and paralysis, is a misuse of language. It is nonsensical, and it creates a linguistic and epistemological muddle, which no amount of psychosomatic research can clarify. Therefore, Saz argues, Calling things like ADHD, depression, or schizophrenia mental illnesses is a bad analogy between psychology and medicine. Psychiatrists do not diagnose illnesses, but detect what Saz would call problems of living. They don't treat disorders, but help clients alter their thoughts and behavior in productive ways. I should pause because Saz has been heavily criticized for these views. The main criticism is that Saz has a restrictive understanding of medicine and a misinformed view of psychiatry. Saz says that medical diseases require pathogens as their cause, but as many critics suggest otherwise. Doctors diagnose, for instance, migraines, fibromyalgia, and irritable bowel syndrome, all disorders without known pathogenic causes called idiopathic conditions. 
Critics also suggest against Saz that psychiatry does have to do with the physical brain. Schizophrenia, for instance, both seems to have strong genetic predictors and correlates to identifiable differences in brains. Also, talk treatments can work with certain psychiatric problems, but others often require and respond well to medical treatments. Why would that be if psychiatric problems were not illnesses? To this, Saz responds with a reminder that where medicine is pretty value neutral, psychiatry is always laden with value judgments. Here's Saz again. While it is generally accepted that mental illness has something to do with man's social or interpersonal relations, it is paradoxically maintained that problems of value, that is, of ethics, do not arise in this process. Take homosexuality, which was listed in the DSM as a psychiatric disorder until 1973. Why? Presumably, the nature of homosexuality didn't change. Rather, society changed, and people were less willing to call homosexuality a problem that should be fixed, instead recognizing it as a legitimate human variation. Or take attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Looking through the DSM-5's diagnostic criteria, quote, having it doesn't just come down to having, say, difficulty focusing for long periods or hyperactivity, but having these things in inappropriate settings or ways. But won't different doctors judge that differently? And since there is no identifiable pathogen that tells us whether a patient, quote, has ADHD, it's really a judgment about whether certain behaviors are inappropriate, inconvenient, or unreasonable. When Saz calls mental illness a myth, remember, he doesn't mean that psychological trouble doesn't exist, or that it shouldn't be taken seriously. He means that psychiatry misrepresents itself as being a value-free science, when in reality, says Saz, it's really a technique of social control. People, according to Saz, will always have distress. And because we are individuals who exist among other individuals, we will always have interpersonal conflict. And frankly, people who need to be kept to the rules of society. Psychiatry, Saz says, is our modern way to keep those people in check while looking like we are doing neutral medicine. Again, take ADHD. In our society, we have deeply centered childhood around modern schools. Well, schools require students to pay sustained attention to material even when they'd rather do other things, and it requires the teacher don't spend much of their time getting students' attention. Put those conditions together, and only then does ADHD become a disorder. Not because the student has a pathogen that we must treat, but because they have a behavior about them that is inconvenient for the school process. Or take various addiction disorders. Part of diagnosing them has to do with whether they get in the way of a patient's normal or appropriate functioning. But what is that? And how will that judgment be made without the psychiatrist abiding by the dominant values of society? Why is there, say, internet addiction disorder, but not book addiction disorder? Because our society looks at books as a sign of culture, and the internet is possibly a dangerous mixed bag. Societies need social control, ways to make sure that everyone is abiding by the norms that make it possible. But at the very least, says Saz, psychiatry needs to be honest that this is what it's doing, not the neutral practice of medicine. For these reasons, you can probably see why Saz has a huge issue with involuntary psychiatry, the idea of committing someone to treatment or therapy against their will in the name of bettering them. He even goes so far as to compare the practice to witch hunting or religious inquisitions or even slavery. Here's Saz again. Formerly, the Inquisitor accused the citizen of witchcraft and proved him to be a witch. Today, the institutional psychiatrist accuses the citizen of mental illness and diagnoses him as psychotic. Religious inquisitions were hunts for people who deviated from the ways of the prescribed religion. Something inside the heretic, it seemed, compelled that deviation, in which case the person was justifiably restrained for punishment. Slavery has often been rationalized, by appeals to something about the slave that rendered them unsuitable for freedom, that justified coercing them, allegedly, for their own good. Saz says it's no hyperbole to see involuntary psychiatry as the same in its basics. Speculate that there's something inside the person that causes undesired behavior, something we can't detect by a physical pathogen, behavior only, and then use that as a basis to hold and treat that person against their will. And if they try to defy that treatment, that too becomes evidence of their unfitness for freedom. Lastly, all of this adds up to what Saz calls the psychiatric state or pharmacracy. We have so internalized the language and ways of psychiatry that we build it into our self-image and institutions. Someone who repeats the same behavior a number of times might joke, oh, that's just my OCD. 
even if they have no official diagnosis. A child who persistently can't or refuses to pay attention at school, at assignments, will be quickly suspected of ADHD. Those who commit murder can evade a full conviction if they plead insanity and if they can convince a psychiatrist that their rage fits the profile of a psychiatric disorder. Illegal street drugs can alleviate anxiety, and so can psychiatric medications, but if you can convince a psychiatrist to prescribe you the latter, you're treating the anxiety disorder. If you're just using the former, you're just getting high. Well, there we have it. So for Saz, the problem starts when we mistake a metaphor, mental illness, for an actual description. Once we treat mental states as medical diseases, we can easily justify all of the above things. We spot more and more mental diseases that we can treat, we treat problems of living with medical solutions, and we expand the role of psychiatric treatments into more and more areas of our lives that need social control. Here's where Saz is most often misunderstood. He's not saying that there are no such things as psychological problems, that using drugs to aid behavior change is bad, or even that therapy is bad. So what is he for? What's his version of how we should treat these mental health issues? In The Ethics of Psychoanalysis, Saz describes his view of the proper therapeutic process. Here's what he says. In brief, then, the psychotherapist observes people, not minds. To be sure, people are often unhappy and unsuccessful. However, if we choose to call them for this reason sick, we use language metaphorically and rhetorically. Accordingly, the psychiatrist does not treat mental illness, but relates to and communicates with a fellow human being. For Saz, the language of illness and treatment degrades the relationship between therapist and client. It tells the latter that she's broken and the therapist that her job is to fix. For Saz, the therapist's job is to listen to a client and help the client figure out how to change in ways the client wants to change. Those may involve listening, suggesting, analyzing problematic situations, or yes, even drug therapies. But none of this should be seen as a medical transaction. Also important for Saz, the therapist's allegiance should always be with the client. One of Saz's problems with the therapeutic state is that the therapist is often the agent of the state, or the family who wants the client committed, or the insurance company who only pay for certain treatments, or recognize certain diagnoses, or the government who is deliberating on how to deal with the client's troublemaking behavior. These situations mean that the therapist is acting less as the agent of the client than as society's agent. It amounts, again, to practicing social control as if it's medicine. Saz's ideal therapist always follows the lead of the client. Saz also thinks that psychiatry is too often a way to avoid hard political and social problems. Some people's lives do not go at all well, and we often have unwanted thoughts and behavior. Social conditions can interact with us in an anxiety or depression-inducing way. But these are problems of living, both as individuals and as social units. Treating these medically is often a convenient way to avert our conversations away from tackling hard ethical, social, or political problems. Instead of changing schools and how we teach, for example, diagnose and medicate kids who have trouble in the system. This is Thomas Saz. If anything, he's been a lightning rod. He's inspired other critics of psychiatry like Gary Greenberg, Sammy Tamimi, Joanna Moncrief, while infuriating a great many other people. But I think his message is subtle and interesting regardless of whether we accept it. He poses some meaty challenges not just to do with psychiatry, but with the nature of liberty, course of power, human diversity, and justice. Sometimes the best critics of a profession come from inside that profession, and entrenched professions, and psychiatry is surely one of those, needs those critics if only for periodic rethinking. But will we accept that challenge? <laughs>